Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the singular value decomposition, often called the SVD. Now going back to the Eigen decomposition for a second, we learned that the Eigen decomposition, which looks like that, can only be used for diagonalizable square matrices. So it's only kind of a small class of matrices. Now the SVD basically generalizes that. It says that if you have any m by n matrix, m being the number of rows, n being the number of columns, then we can use this decomposition. So this basically opens up to use on a lot more matrices. Now another notion we're going to need to address early on to really grasp this is the rank. So remember the rank of a matrix is the number of linearly independent columns. So sometimes it's very small, which means that most columns are just combinations of a small number of columns. Sometimes it's very large, which means that most of the columns in our matrix are linearly independent from each other. So let's say the rank of our matrix M is P. And remember, P has to be less than or equal to the number of columns in the matrix. So P is less than or equal to N. Another consequence of the rank being P means that we can express our matrix M as the sum of small rank 1 matrices. So sometimes these are called atoms. And I do like that language because it really hits the point home that we can take our matrix and decompose it into the sum of these more simple atoms. So here's one atom, U1, V1 transpose. Let's think for a second what the dimensionality of this atom would be. So U1 would be a m vector, so it has m elements in it, and V1 would have n elements in it. So if we multiply U1 by V1 transpose, we're going to get not a single number like a dot product, that would be if it was switched, but we're going to get a m by n matrix, which is exactly what our big M is. So all the math does work out in this case. Let's dig a little deeper and think about really what's going on here. This is going to be a rank 1 matrix, right? That's the form we know as a rank 1 matrix. And we're basically saying we're going to add up P of these rank 1 matrices together, each one having its own coefficient sigma 1 all the way to sigma P. And when we add those atoms together, that's going to be what we call our original matrix. That's what it means for our original matrix to be rank P. That means that U1, U2, all the way to UP have to be linearly independent from each other. Same thing for V1 through VP. So that was really the hard part of this video, is just understanding that a matrix being rank P means that we can break it up into the sum of a bunch of these tiny atoms, P of them, each atom being a rank 1 matrix. So now let's go ahead and follow this arrow and try to write this in a more clean matrix form. So let's take all of these U1 through UP and put them in their own matrix called U. And it's going to be helpful for us to always be talking about dimensionality. So what's the dimensionality of this thing which we're calling U? So the number of rows here is going to be M because each U has M elements in it. And the number of columns is clearly going to be P because there's P of them. So U is M by P. Now let's collect all of these sigma 1, sigma 2, all the way to sigma P into the diagonal of this big sigma matrix. So this is going to be P by P clearly because there are P of these sigmas and everything else would be zero. And finally taking a look at V, we're going to collect V1 transpose all the way to VP transpose and stack them together into our V transpose matrix. The dimensionality of this would have to be P rows and the number of columns would be N because each V1 we said has N elements in it. So that means that V transpose would be P by N. This is good news because it means our matrix multiplication works out and gives us m by n in the end, which is exactly the dimensionality of our original matrix. Now let's state a few facts about each of these matrices, which we are going to basically consolidate from what we said before. So u and v are both going to be orthonormal matrices, which basically implies that u transpose u and v transpose v are both going to be equal to the identity matrix. Why is this true? Remember, something we said is that all the u's are linearly independent from each other and all the v's are linearly independent to each other. Which means that if we multiply that matrix of u's or matrix of v's by its respective transpose, we're going to get the identity matrix. And the other thing is that sigma 1 through sigma p are all collected in the diagonal of this big sigma matrix. Of course, that means it's a diagonal matrix. So that is basically the singular value decomposition, which is breaking up any matrix m into U, Sigma, V transpose, where U and V are orthonormal matrices, and Sigma is a diagonal matrix. Now let's go into a little bit of terminology about why it's actually called the singular value decomposition. So we can rearrange these a little bit. If we take this equation here, and I multiply by V on the right-hand side of both equations, I can get MV is equal to U Sigma. If I multiply by U transpose from the left on both sides of this equation, 
I could get this. So these are just equivalent statements of what I've already written. But they help to understand where this terminology comes from. So because of this equation here, we call V1 through VP, which remember are the columns now of V, which were the rows of V transpose. These VI through VP are called the right singular vectors of M. So just like we have eigenvectors and eigenvalues, in that same terminology we have right singular vectors. And in parallel, because of this equation here, since U is on the left in this case, U1 through UP are left singular vectors of our matrix M. And the last piece of terminology is that sigma1 through sigma p are called the singular values of our matrix M. Okay, so just to recap what we have so far, we can take any matrix, break it into U, sigma, V transpose with these properties. Right singular vectors are the Vs, left singular vectors are the Us, sigma1 through sigma p are the singular values. So the last part of this video is going to be addressing this from a data science perspective about why is this actually useful. It's cool, we can break it down, but what does it actually help us to physically accomplish in the real world? Let's look at a quick example. There's many applications, but here's just one that comes to mind. Suppose that we have some M matrix, which is 100 by 10. So to put it in real terms, we have 100 rows or 100 samples or observations and 10 columns, 10 features, 10 predictors, 10 variables. So it's 100 by 10. That means we need a thousand numbers, which is 100 times 10, to represent this matrix. Let's see if we can represent it with fewer numbers using this idea of the SVD. Suppose that the sigma 1 is equal to 3. Sigma 2 is equal to 2. So the first two singular values are 3 and 2 respectively. And suppose for all the other singular values, so for any i greater than 2, sigma i would be pretty much 0. So we're basically saying that there's almost nothing in any of the other singular values in our matrix. That means that if we were to write out this full form for M, all of these sigma i's past i equals 2 would basically be vanished. They would basically have zero contribution to the matrix. That's why we say that the matrix M is basically driven by the first two singular values. So it's nearly equal to sigma 1 u1 v1 transpose plus sigma 2 u2 v2 transpose. Now this means we can write it in this matrix form, just putting u1 and u2 sigma 1, sigma 2 on the diagonal, and then V1 transpose, V2 transpose in the rows of the V transpose matrix. Nothing new here, basically just writing it in this form with a concrete number of P equals 2. So let's think about how many numbers that is now to represent basically the same matrix. So this U, remember, is M by P, which is 100 by 2. So there's 200 numbers to care about in there. Let's take a look at V transpose. That's going to be 2 by 10 or P by N, so that's basically 20 numbers to care about, and the diagonal matrix only has two numbers to care about, sigma 1 and sigma 2, so that's just going to be two numbers to care about. If we add up all of these numbers, we get 222 numbers that are basically going to capture all the dynamics of our original matrix M. So what we essentially achieved here is pretty awesome. It's better than a 25% reduction in how much data it would take to store this matrix. Before it took 1,000 numbers, now it takes less than 250 numbers. So that's just one of the big applications of SVD for data science, is that we can take a matrix that's potentially very large, and using the SVD, we can compress this into a much smaller space, losing very little data along the way. So I hope you learned about what the SVD is in this video, and why it's useful for us as data scientists and economists and statisticians and so on. Any comments, please leave them below, and I will see you next time.